My name is Charlotte, and I was raised in a tiny town where everyone was acquainted with one another. Elizabeth, my sister, is just a year older than I am, and I honestly felt we were rather close when we were kids. Both of our parents worked long hours at the nearby plant and were industrious people. Although we weren't wealthy, we managed to get by. Our grandparents' Sunday meals were the true highlight of our weeks. We lived next door to mom's folks. There was something unique about those dinners. Grandpa would regale us with tales of the past while grandma would prepare a feast. Sitting at their large wood table, surrounded by the aroma of home-cooked food and the coziness of family, I always enjoyed those get-togethers. Even in those days, Elizabeth was always more preoccupied with her phone than the family chat. She would mutter to me, God, these dinners take forever, while browsing her social media accounts beneath the table. I could be hanging out with my friends right now. Before we knew it, Elizabeth was leaving for college to study management. Time passed quickly. Dressed to the nines and sharing flawlessly filtered images on Instagram, she was all about the glossy life. A year later, I followed her, but I took a different route. Design is what I choose to study. Both of us were able to attend respectable public universities, thanks to our parents' savings. They weren't particularly upscale, but they were reliable institutions that would provide us with a quality education. Mom would proudly say, your sister is going to be a successful businesswoman, and Charlotte, well, she's always been good with her hands. At the time, I didn't mind the analogy. I was too preoccupied with developing my passion for design, thinking of making beautiful things, and scribbling bridal gowns in the corners of my notebooks during lectures. I had no idea how drastically our careers would diverge or how a one-family meal would alter everything. I can see now that the symptoms were present from the start. I was happy working in the background, but Elizabeth was always vying for attention. However, neither of us realized how our decisions would ultimately cause our family to fall apart when our grandparents invited us all to a special supper following graduation. Even though the restaurant was full that night, my attention was solely on the envelope Grandpa was carrying. The entire family became quiet as he cleared his throat and got to his feet. Elizabeth, Charlotte, he exclaimed in a passionate tone. Your grandma and I have seen you both mature, get college degrees, and become into stunning young ladies. We wish to assist you in getting off to a good start in life. He gave an envelope to each of us. $50,000 is available for each of you. Make good use of it. My water almost swallowed me. $50,000. I have never seen that much money in my life. Elizabeth, however, didn't even wait for dessert before making plans. She declared, I'm opening an exclusive clothing store while surfing through her phone. Upscale labels and designer selections. It will be incredible. Have you done any market research? Recalling her business management lessons, I inquired. She gave an eye roll. I know what sells, Charlotte, please. This is going to be massive, I promise you. Elizabeth was off and running in an instant. She rented this absurd apartment in the priciest area of town, the type where you feel underdressed simply by passing the windows. Her Instagram was overflowing with fresh content every day. Elizabeth calling herself a youthful CEO establishing her empire, posing in high-end clothing, and attending business meetings. She once told me, look at this marketing campaign I'm launching, while displaying the thousands of dollars she was spending on social media advertisements. The greatest sales team in town has been hired by me. We will be the upcoming big thing. I took my time in the interim. I ran figures, created spreadsheets, and conducted research for weeks. My dreams have never been the same. In want to be a part of someone's special day, I decided to make wedding gowns. 
I discovered this little, unpretentious area with promise and wonderful natural light. I designed the layout myself, including a welcoming waiting room for brides and a comfy workstation. I contacted Maria, a fantastic seamstress I'd known for years and who knew more about bridal gowns than anybody else in the community. As we prepared the studio, she said, Charla, this could really work. I know how to make your sketches come to life, and you have a great eye for design. I also gave my best buddy from design school, Sarah, a call. Want to contribute to the happiness of some brides? I questioned her. She was on board right away. We began modestly, using only a basic website and a few local flyers instead of elaborate advertising efforts. Her cousin, who had visited our studio and appreciated how intimate it seemed, was our first bride. After that, her buddy and her friend's sister arrived. Through word of mouth, we began to establish a reputation gradually. One day, Elizabeth walked by and stated, You're doing this all wrong. Where is your approach to social media? How do you position your brand? You must have a more expansive perspective. However, my thoughts were different, not larger. Every bride was exceptional, and every dress we created was one of a kind. I spoke with actual ladies and listened to their fantasies about their ideal wedding gown as Elizabeth posted about being a girl boss in her fancy clothes. The first year was tough but rewarding. We started with simple designs at reasonable prices, just trying to get our name out there. I remember our first $1,000 dress. The bride hugged me so hard after the final fitting, I thought she might never let go. Charla, you've made my dream come true, she said, twirling in front of the mirror. Word spread quickly after that. By the second year, we were getting more elaborate requests. Can you do hand beading? Is it possible to add custom lace? Of course we could. Maria's skills were incredible, and Sarah had a real talent for details. We started doing bridesmaid dresses, too. It just made sense when brides kept asking. Meanwhile, Elizabeth's Instagram posts were getting desperate. The designer clothes and her photos were the same ones over and over. Her exclusive store was empty most days. I'd walk past sometimes and see her sitting alone at the counter, scrolling through her phone. Then one day, Mom called me in tears. Your sister's in trouble, Charlotte. She's losing everything. Elizabeth had blown through the entire $50,000 in loans she'd taken out. Expensive rent unsold inventory, the massive advertising campaigns, it all caught up with her. Her empire collapsed in just three years. I don't understand, she sobbed at a family dinner. I did everything right. I had the perfect location, the best brands. Everything except actually running a business, I thought, but kept my mouth shut. She looked so different now, no more designer clothes no more perfectly staged photos. Depression hit her hard. That's when mom and dad started their campaign. Charlotte, honey, mom began one evening at their house. Your sister needs a job and you need a manager. It's perfect. She could help you expand the business. But the pressure was constant. Elizabeth started showing up at the studio unannounced critiquing everything from our booking system to our window display. You really should be more active on social media, she'd say, or this space is too small for a successful business. Finally, during yet another family dinner where they were all ganging up on me, I snapped. Are you kidding me? I stood up, my chair scraping against the floor. Elizabeth couldn't keep her own business afloat for three years. She burned through $50,000 in loans on Instagram ads and designer clothes. She never did market research, never tracked inventory properly, never built real relationships with customers. And now you want her to manage my business. Elizabeth's face crumpled. You think you're so much better than me, don't you? 
No, I just think you're a terrible businesswoman. You can't manage my studio. You couldn't even manage your own store. The silence that followed was deafening. Elizabeth burst into tears and ran from the room. Mom was shaking with anger. How dare you speak to your sister that way? Dad thundered. After everything she's been through, everything she's been through. I grabbed my purse. You mean everything she did to herself. I'm done. Done with the guilt trips, done with the pressure, done with all of it. I walked out that night and I haven't been back since. Three years of hard work building my business and my family wanted to hand it over to the person who'd proven she couldn't handle it. Three years can change a lot. My little studio wasn't so little anymore. We'd expanded into the space next door, hired two more seamstresses, and had a waiting list months long. Our dresses now started at $8,000, and nobody blinked an eye. Quality speaks for itself. Charlotte, we need to raise our prices again, Maria told me one morning. We're turning away too many brides. She was right. Between her masterful sewing, Sarah's eye for detail, and my designs, we'd built something special. Each dress was a work of art, and word had spread far beyond our little town. I was reviewing some sketches when the message popped up on my phone. Elizabeth. My stomach did a weird flip when I saw her name. We hadn't spoken since that night at our parents' house. No, hi, no, how are you? Just, I'm getting married in two months, and I need a wedding dress. Can you do it? I nearly dropped my phone. Elizabeth getting married? Last I'd heard, through Mom's occasional updates, which I never asked for. But God, anyway, she was working some office job and still living in her old apartment. Two months, I typed back. Elizabeth, we usually need five to six months for a custom dress. There's a whole process, multiple fittings, adjustments. Her response came immediately. Come on, Charlotte, we're sisters. Or are you too successful now to help your own family? Must be nice being so successful you can turn away your own sister. I stared at the message for a long time. The old Charlotte would have fired back something nasty, but I'd grown up a lot in three years. Let me check my schedule, I wrote instead. I spent that night reworking our entire production timeline. We had a bride, Jessica, whose dress was scheduled to start next week. I'd have to call her and explain we couldn't take her order after all. I'm so sorry, I told Jessica the next morning. I know this is unexpected. I'd like to give you this custom veil as an apology. It's one of our best pieces and I have a colleague who does beautiful work. She can make your dress exactly as we planned. Jessica was disappointed but understood. I shifted three other dresses around, knowing we'd be working overtime for a week. Are you sure about this? Sarah asked when I told her about Elizabeth's dress. After everything that happened, I wasn't sure. But I replied to Elizabeth's message. Okay, I'll make your dress. Come in next Tuesday at 10 o'clock a.m. for measurements. The response was just, great. Make it good. No thank you. No acknowledgement of the massive favor I was doing her. Just entitlement, same as always. But something made me want to do this. Maybe curiosity, maybe hope, maybe just the chance to prove something to myself. When Elizabeth came in for her first appointment, I decided to do something I'd never done before, offer a family discount. The dress you want would normally be $10,000, I explained, showing her my sketches. But I'll only charge you for materials and seamstress time, $5,500. Elizabeth barely glanced at the price. Oh, that's fine. Richard, my fiancé, can easily afford it. He's loaded, owns half the commercial real estate downtown. That was the beginning of what felt like an endless stream of fittings and alterations. Elizabeth was in the studio constantly, 
always wanting to tweak something about the dress. The neckline needs to be lower, she'd say one day. No, higher the next. Can we add more beading, different lace, more sparkle? At first, it was exhausting, but gradually, something shifted. Between fittings, Elizabeth would plop down on our plush consultation sofa, kick off her shoes, and talk, and talk, and talk. Richard's such a bore, she'd say, rolling her eyes while Maria pinned her hem. All he does is talk about business and golf, but his bank account, she'd make a chef's kiss gesture, makes up for everything. I kept my face neutral, focusing on adjusting a seam. You don't think that might be a problem. Please he know what's a problem, being broke. Besides, you should see his family. Elizabeth lowered her voice conspiratorially. His sister goes to therapy twice a week. Like how much asterisk 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 end up do you have to be? The gossip was endless. Richard's mother was trying too hard to stay young. His father was probably having an affair with his secretary. Her friends weren't spared either. She had a nickname for each one, usually focusing on their insecurities or failures. Jenny Bad Botox Miller is going to be so jealous of this dress, she'd laugh. And Sarah Forever Single Thompson. She's going to die when she sees me walking down the aisle. I should have been put off by all of it. The old me would have called her out and started another fight. But something held me back. Maybe it was the way she'd automatically reach for my hand when she saw herself in the mirror, or how she'd bring me coffee, remembering exactly how I liked it when she came for fittings. Small moments like these made me think, maybe, just maybe, we were finding our way back to being sisters. The gossip made me uncomfortable, and her attitude toward her fiancé worried me. But wasn't this what I'd wanted? A chance to repair our relationship. So I nodded and smiled, letting her chatter fill the studio while the dress took shape under my hands. With each fitting, each coffee, each shared memory, I felt the wall between us crumbling just a little bit more. Things were looking up. Elizabeth and I even reconnected on social media. Suddenly, my feed was full of her engagement photos and wedding planning updates. She tagged me in posts about the dress, always with lots of heart emojis, and best sister ever captions. Mom called me one evening, sounding happier than she had in years. I'm so glad you girls worked things out, she said, her voice thick with emotion. This is all we ever wanted, you know, our family back together. Dad even stopped by the studio one day, awkwardly hovering near the entrance before pulling me into a tight hug. We missed you, kiddo, he mumbled into my hair. It felt good, really good, like maybe the past three years of silence had been worth it if this was the result. A week before the wedding, Elizabeth called me. The dress is ready, right? She asked, excitement bubbling in her voice. I'm having my bachelorette party tomorrow night at Moonlight Bar. Can you bring it? I want all my girls to see it. The next evening, I carefully packed the dress into our nicest gift box, the one with our studio's gold logo embossed on cream-colored paper. I'd spent countless hours on this dress, the hand-beaded bodice, the delicate lace overlay, the subtle shimmer in the train. It was some of my best work. The taxi dropped me off at Moonlight Bar, and I could hear the party before I saw it, laughter and music spilling out onto the street. Inside, a group of women in matching Teen Bride t-shirts crowded around tables, decorated with pink balloons and scattered rose petals. Elizabeth squealed when she saw me. Girls, girls, the dress is here. They gathered around as I carefully lifted it from the box. The reaction was everything a designer could hope for. Gasps, sighs, a few tears. Elizabeth, it's absolutely gorgeous. I've never seen anything like it. The detail work is incredible. Your sister is so talented. The dress made its rounds, 
each bridesmaid taking turns holding it up and admiring different aspects. I felt proud, not just of the dress, but of this moment, standing here with my sister, sharing in her happiness. When the dress was safely back in its box, I grabbed a glass of wine from the bar and found an empty chair at one of the tables. The night was young, the mood was festive, and for the first time in years, I felt like I truly belonged in my sister's life again. I was just getting comfortable, taking my first sip of wine, when I felt a harsh tug on my arm. Elizabeth stood over me, her perfectly made-up face twisted into an expression I knew all too well from our childhood, pure disdain. What do you think you're doing? She hissed, her manicured nails digging into my arm. Having a drink, I said, confused, celebrating with you. Elizabeth let out a sharp, cruel laugh that made several heads turn, celebrating with me. Oh, honey, you're not a guest here. You're the seamstress. You delivered the dress. Now it's time for you to go. The wine glass nearly slipped from my hand. What, ladies? Elizabeth announced to the room, her voice dripping with fake sweetness. I think there's been a misunderstanding. Charlotte isn't joining us. She's just the dressmaker I hired. You know, like when the caterer drops off food. They don't stay for the party. The silence in the room was deafening. Some of the women looked uncomfortable, others confused. One of them, who I now recognized as Richard's sister, Amanda, gave me a sympathetic look. All this playing nice, Elizabeth continued, waving her hand dismissively. The coffee dates, the sister bonding, that was just business. I needed a dress, you needed a customer. Let's not pretend it was anything more. Something snapped inside me. Three years of silence, followed by months of fake reconciliation. It was too much. If she wanted the truth out, fine. Let's have all the truth. Just business. I stood up slowly, setting my wine glass down with deliberate care. Okay, Elizabeth, let's talk business. Let's talk about how you've spent the last two months telling me what a boring, pathetic man your fiancé is. Elizabeth's face went pale. Charlotte, don't you dare. Oh, what was it you called him? A walking ATM? A necessary evil? Ladies, did you know Elizabeth doesn't even like Richard? She just likes his bank account. Amanda stood up from her seat, her face shocked. Elizabeth tried to interrupt, but I was on a roll. And Amanda. I turned to her. Your future sister-in-law here has some lovely opinions about you. What was it you called her? Her? Elizabeth sneered. The crazy one. The family nutcase who needs therapy twice a week to function. Amanda's hand flew to her mouth. Is that true? I have proof, I said, pulling out my phone. Elizabeth's been sending me voice messages for months. Want to hear them? Before Elizabeth could stop me, I played the first message. God, Amanda is such a mental case. Richard says she's been in therapy for years. Can you imagine being that messed up? Then another. Jenny's Botox makes her look like a surprised fish. At least she'll look appropriate when she sees my dress. Her jaw's already permanently dropped. And another. Sarah's so desperate to find a man, she'll probably try to catch the bouquet before I even throw it. What a pathetic spinster. One by one, the women around the room recognized Elizabeth's cruel nicknames and comments about them. Jenny touched her face self-consciously. Sarah wiped away tears. Amanda grabbed her purse and ran out the door. These are your friends? I said, my voice shaking, your bridesmaids, and this is how you talk about them behind their backs. The room erupted into chaos. Women were grabbing their bags, some crying, others yelling at Elizabeth. Elizabeth stood in the middle of it all, her face contorted with rage and panic, as her carefully constructed world fell apart around her. She's lying, she screamed. 
Charlotte's making this up because she's jealous. But the voice messages were still playing, her own voice condemning her with every word. I picked up my purse and the empty dress box at the door. I turned back one last time. By the way, you haven't paid for the dress yet. I'll send you the invoice, full price this time. No family discount for someone who isn't really family. The morning after the bachelorette party disaster, my phone rang at 7 o'clock a.m. Mom's name flashed on the screen. What have you done? She screamed before I could even say hello. Elizabeth is hysterical. The wedding might be called off. How could you ruin your sister's special day? I sat up in bed, suddenly wide awake. How could I ruin it? Are you kidding me? Amanda won't even speak to her. Half the bridesmaids have dropped out. This is all your fault. The familiar anger bubbled up, the same feeling I'd had three years ago. Naturally, I am to blame. Isn't it always my fault? It's never Elizabeth's fault, Mom. Not when her company went bankrupt. Not when she was so disrespectful to me. Not after she disparaged her fiancé and his family for months. She hasn't even paid for her outfit, by the way. No, Charlotte. I'm done, Mom. She may now lie in her bed, which Elizabeth made. And you're just as nasty as Dad. Always supporting her, always defending her. I finished it everything. One week went by, and then another. I put myself into my profession, meeting with brides who genuinely valued what I did, and designing new designs. I made an effort to ignore the wedding that could or might not have taken place. Then three weeks following the bachelorette party, I saw Mom's number on my phone once more. I nearly didn't respond. Charlotte, she said in a different, hesitant, softer voice this time. She told me all about it. I owe you an apology. Although the wedding had taken place, it paled in comparison to the lavish occasion Elizabeth had organized. Amanda and his parents did not go, but Richard had forgiven Elizabeth. The chapel was half empty, and the majority of the bridesmaids withdrew. Mom's voice cracked as she continued, I was wrong. About Elizabeth, I've always been mistaken. Now I see that. I simply, all I wanted was for both of my girls to be content. I'm content without Elizabeth in my life, Mom. A lengthy pause ensued. I understand. I deposited the whole $110,000 payment for the outfit. Thank you. We then discovered a new normal. Only after I realized Elizabeth wouldn't be there did I resume going to see my folks. She apparently followed suit. We came up with an unwritten timetable. I received Sunday meals. She got holidays. We behaved like kind strangers when we happened to meet paths. Mom would occasionally try to tell me about Elizabeth, including her marital issues and her attempts to blend in with Richard's social group. Every time, I shifted the topic. I no longer cared about her life. My own life, it's very fantastic. The studio is doing quite well. We are considering opening a second site. This amazing man I'm dating creates handcrafted furniture. He understands the entire creative business aspect. One of my outfits appeared in a well-known wedding magazine last month. Late at night, I occasionally reflect on that bachelorette party and question whether I made the correct decision. However, I know I did because I recall Elizabeth's voice in those messages, the casual harshness, the phony sisterly closeness. The finest families are sometimes the ones you pick, such as coworkers who become family or friends who become sisters. I brought on two new seamstresses yesterday. I have an appointment with a real estate agent next week to discuss a location in the city. With or without the individuals who formerly held us back, life goes on.